Hello Arnie, welcome. My name's Ian Campbell from Palliative Care Australia on the chilly lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people in Canberra. Welcome to another round of Thursdays at Three, our regular series of conversations with people living and working at the end of life. Today, a deep dive into the Healthy End of Life Program, or HELP for short, run out of La Trobe University's Public Health Palliative Care Unit. HELP's mission is to develop a collaborative end of life culture to meet people's health and social needs tapping into the capacity of those strong community networks to add weight to the care offered by health professionals. And in the end, meeting the needs of palliative care patients and families. The HELP app, which was launched in the last 12 months, is part of the scaffolding around this program. Dr. Andrea Grinrod is the Director of the Public Health Palliative Care Unit at La Trobe and brings professional and very personal perspectives to her work and leadership of the HELP program. Correct me if I'm wrong, Andrea, but your work and the, the, the HELP app and the, the, the HELP program seems to be about connecting the dots, making those connections, building that network around palliative care patients and their, and their families. Is that the mug's explanation for this? <laughs> it's spot on. It's absolutely correct. At the end of the day, a public health palliative care approach recognises that everyone has a role to play. The Healthy End of Life program is a broader framework, is a health promotion approach to palliative end of life care, which is acknowledges our social well-being at the end of life. Um, and the HELP app is a network-centred approach. So it really is bringing together the uh, formal care networks or the mm -hmm. formal care service providers in palliative end of life care with the informal care networks that we know have a really valuable contribution to improving people's experiences at the end of life. We both need excellent medical and health care and we need excellent social and practical supports as well. So we're trying to bring together um, for an integrated end of life care system, I think for the first time in our field, how we tangibly connect the formal care service delivery with the informal care networks that have a crucial and essential role to play and also collect data on those networks so that for the first time we have an understanding from a data set of what the informal care networks are doing around people at the end of life. And there's a wonderful, there's an incredible opportunity for palliative end of life care services and other healthcare settings to be the catalyst for network centred care. Oh, such a powerful idea, Andrea, and I, I can't help but think where does where does the need for this come from or where did the idea for this come from and when you talk to people who need to be engaged with the the health sector they they talk about how the health sector can often operate in silos and not necessarily talk to each other and people get frustrated by that and don't get the level of care that they perhaps deserve and it seems to me what you're trying to do is, is knit that formal network together and pair it with that informal network and together a really powerful force for delivering quality care to the, the patient and their, their families. Um, where did the idea for this come from? Is, is it that human experience of trying to engage with the health sector sometimes? You're, you're right. It is trying to knit all that together in a way for a more integrated approach and to then be able to collect the data on that kind of integrated approach as well. So that, that's the challenge that we're trying to, um, to, uh, to I suppose, remedy in, in some way or at least make a contribution towards, you know, helping, helping that kind of um, element of end-of-life care if we possibly can. And I think that one of the challenges that we've always found in public health palliative care, because it is so complex and it shows up in so many different ways, we've never been able to demonstrate effectively, systematically, and through central digital platforms, the impact of those interventions. We've had a lot of interest from, you know, Commonwealth government in the past and state governments. There's public health palliative care programs across the country in the form of, you know, connector programs and so forth. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is to bring that sector together that is very diverse, and that's fine because that's what public health looks like. It shows up in different ways. But we're trying to provide some sort of a structure around that where everybody can use the HELP app. It's like a targeted public yep. health palliative care intervention that is can be delivered in five minutes or one hour, so easy to use. That kind of catalyst sets off that data collection 
um, system for us. Um, and then we can then get that kind of understanding of how, what, what impact and, and what does it look like? What do the social dimensions of end of life care look like for Australians? What, what's the impact that they're having? What's the contribution that they're making? And starting a kind of narrative on, on what the social dimensions of caring is. And, um, and so that's what we're trying to achieve. That's what we're working towards achieving. I love the way that you prioritise the casseroles and the advice <laughs> of an oncologist, and it's all together in the one the one spot. And, and the help app really really supports that and, and gives equal importance to both. They, they're both really important. You've got some trials yeah. underway at the moment. Um, how are those trials going of this, this sort of network-centred care approach? Tell us about the trials that are happening. Yes, well, they're early days. We have a... Um, we have um, uh, arrangements in place to commence trials. We haven't started them, but mm -hmm. I just want to say something about the comment that you just had with the oncologist and the casseroles. I was once delivering a presentation in New Zealand on this, and um, one of the things that we've learned through our practice, uh, and, and you, you mentioned oncologist because he came and said to me, it has never occurred to me in all of my years of practice to say to my patients, this is what your formal care is going to look like but equally important, go home and talk with your family, friends and neighbours to support you. And he said, it's such a simple thing and I can't yeah. believe I haven't done it and it doesn't take any time. It takes me 30 seconds to do that. Um, so it, it's good that um, it's so easy and can be picked up, you know, in that way um, as well. But what we absolutely do know too that works is that it's, it's difficult for people to ask for help, especially when they're vulnerable. Yeah. We know that the HELP app is going to, and network-centred care is going to work best when it comes from a trusted source of referral. Mm -hmm. So when it comes from health authorities or people who trust um, who is providing their care, um, and when it's provided through facilitated uptake. When a health professional, whether it's a doctor or a nurse or an OT, is saying, um, uh, we want you to go away and think about your social networks, and here's a resource, either the paper-based version or our app, to think about your networks. When that person goes home and does that social network mapping and those activities that we um, articulate in, in um, net, network mapping care, it's like I'm not asking for help. My nurse has told me to go home and do this. So when it's delivered as an integrated routine yeah. and yeah. their delivery, patients and clients just accept it. It's like, oh, yeah. so this is the way we do palliative care. Oh, okay, because this is we do person-centred, family-centred, network-centred, all the clients get offered, offered this. And when it's just delivered in a way that this is routine, this yep. is what is best practice quality end of life care. They just accept it and go home. And then they say, my doctor told me to do this. And they sit down and organize it. And so then we, I'm we over the guilt. The doctor told me to. Yeah. We get over the guilt of asking for help and the, the self consciousness of asking for help. And we, my doctor told me to do this. My nurse told me to do this. I'm following health advice. I'm asking exactly, for help. Yeah. That's exactly right. And we didn't get that until until we start working with our partners. We don't see that. They they come and tell us that, that that's what's working really well. So, um, yeah, so, so we absolutely know that that's making a really big difference, that health, people aren't just going to go and find this app necessarily integrating it into the various health setting environments and other environments that equally works in disability services, aged care environments as well. It can be, you know, used anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but network-centred care um, is, is something that can be, you know, sort of done by anybody in any kind of setting as well. And that authority, I think, is kind of really, really important part of people accepting it as part of their care treatment plan. Andrea, I hope you don't mind me asking. You're living and breathing this. You and your husband, Greg, and your your family, and your, indeed your your network. You're living and breathing this. Your personal life and your professional life have collided in the last eighteen months. Do you mind sharing some of that experience? No, not at all. Um, you know, I think that um, when we work in palliative care and we find ourselves in a situation where you know um, palliative end life care enters our own world, it's it's a I've spoken to some colleagues in that space and it's a, it's a mix and a blend and it's quite um, uh, a unique in sort of situation to be in, but it's also very personal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that what has really helped myself and Greg is that we've 
I've known this in a theoretical standpoint, and I know this from the research. I've been reading this literature on what I should be doing for many, many years. And so it's a kind of cruel twist of irony that I developed up the Healthy End of Life program and of now, which I face that with my husband, Greg. Yeah. And now I have to apply all the things that I know from a theoretical standpoint practically into my world about where are my social connections, where is my social networks to support myself and Greg to get through what we what lays ahead of us? Mm -hmm. And and I've had to ask for help, and I have to say yes to help when people are asking me, and and so I've had to make this shift from knowing this from a researcher and a practitioner and a theoretical standpoint to actually living this, and that's been a really illuminating process, and and it's been a challenging one, but it's also been incredibly helpful. And what I now know is that it's scary at first, but when you start doing it, it actually gets really easy. When people say, would you like a hand? I just say yes. Yeah. Really, <laughs> yeah. Very, very enthusiastically I say yes <laughs> because I actually do need help. And, and I couldn't have done the initial stage of care when you're in that awful shock that people are in. Um, at, you know, when they get an awful diagnosis and you're thrown into that world of terminal illness and palliative mm -hmm. end-of-life care, it's, it doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter how skilled you are and how long you've been working, when it's happening to you personally yeah. and it, it changes your life, it pulls the rug from out of you, all of that education doesn't mean anything in the moment. Um, but as we move through that, and I, I had this kind of parallel journey in my mind of what I should be doing, and, and I thought this is this is going to be really interesting. Um, I did say yes, and I did reach out, and we and it was my social networks that got my family through that initial six months when it was very rough with, um, you know, kind of brutal chemotherapy treatment plans mm -hmm. and other therapies. And at that point in time, um, my son was. Um, uh, trying to get his driver's licence and was um, also trying to um, enter the Navy actually at that point in time and he had a whole, or he had a, a kind of brutal physical kind of training regime and trying to get his licence and he was hungry all the time. So my networks showed up in great ways. One of my, one of my tasks um, was um, to have a roster of people to take Lucas to meet his Driving hours in Victoria, we need to have 120 oh, hours. We all, yeah. as Victorians, we all complain about that, of course. Um, but it, it, it's in step to my aunties, cousins, uncles, siblings to take Lucas driving so that he could meet those hours when Greg and I couldn't absolutely do it. And food came and online food deliveries came. Our neighbour is still mowing our nature secret strip. And he said, do you still need that? I'm like, yes, we still need that. Sometimes we don't, but it keeps on, it keeps him going. So I find that um, I'm now understanding what it means to be in that place when you're leaning upon the networks to get you through a time when naturally I think we become and there is a real risk that we become socially isolated. And I think that I'm mindful that I need to keep working with our networks, get smaller at this point in time in our lives. And mm -hmm. if you want to average social networks at the end of life, it's actually a task and a project. You have to work at it. You have to make it a decision and explicitly lean into that and be vulnerable and, 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 and think about that for your life. It, it doesn't happen naturally, I don't think, because our natural tendency is to, is to not do that, to to get small when our worlds can get small. So it's hard work to stay focused on that, but it's beneficial most definitely. Mm. Such a powerful example of the, the, the driving lessons example and those 120 hours. It's the same here in Canberra, uh, Andrea. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm in the thick of it with my 16-year-old daughter at the moment. Those 120 hours are, are, are so overwhelming and such a great example of the, the help app and the and the program that it's it's a it's a part of tell me i'm keen to talk to you about data data seems really important and the collection of data seems really important to the to the program and indeed data right across the palliative care sector can be very patchy why is data so important to to this in your work it's because i think with you know i've been um uh, I've been working at the unit for 10 years now at the Public Health Palliative Care Unit at La Trobe University. It started since 1999 and it had Professor Alan Callagher who was a starter and then we were lucky enough to have Bruce Rumbaud for 10 years. Now wow. I'm the director 
Australia, um, which is a privilege to be to have, take on that role after you know such um, eminent kind of people both in 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 that role as the directors. And so I've been working at the unit for ten years, and really it's just been an ongoing challenge and to systematically collect data to demonstrate impact of the kind of work that we've been doing. I've done very large studies on the end on public health palliative care approaches in the disability sector, in the local government sector and in community based environments. And we've collected data. We know that there's an evidence base behind um, public health palliative care approaches. We know that there's an evidence base behind network centred care and the informal um, roles that people play in end of life caregiving and how that shows up in different shapes and sizes. But we've never we've never been able to systematically collect um, data on demonstrating that impact and then understanding that at a national and systematic sort of way. So we are able to, through everyone who uses the Help app, who joins a network, um, we are able to collect data on um, why they're at their why they whether the network is around cancer. To, to, cancer, dementia, um, frail age, disability-related illness, what, so what the illness is, the postcode, the carer, there's a facility for the inner care circle, so you can broadcast messages to just the inner circle or the broader network, so it has a lot okay. of features in this, um, and we can look at the, where, where the, where the uh, network is. We can look at what tasks are being um, asked of the network, what tasks are being picked up of the network, what tasks aren't being picked up of the network. So we can go right down into every sort of detail. And we've never been able to get a snapshot of what mm -hmm. happens when we can start to see what has previously been hidden of all of these informal carers across end of life care within Australia and what kind of contribution they're making and how they're making that contribution. So the person-centered nature of this work is quite incredible. We can see things like make this favorite dish for dad this Sunday, go to the pharmacy and pick this up, drop in this food. I've just had this visit of this. We can see how much the network is chatting with one another. We can't mm -hmm. see their chats, of course, because they are not covered by ethics. We wouldn't want to see people's chats, but we can see the level of interactivity between the network. And we're also able to send out targeted information and education from an evidence-based standpoint to the networks on a weekly, more so um, basis mm -hmm. on grief literacy, end of life care literacy. There's a new resource we can send out targeted um, information on the Victorian support networks to all the Victorian based networks, for example. So we can send new evidence based out to the dementia networks that are sort of government supported. And, and, you know, so we can really, our job is to create and generate the most grief literate, end of life care literate, death literate networks. We can, we can explicitly interact with those networks to make sure that they've got the information that they need to support the carer and the person at the end of life in the inner circle. What we know is with digital literacy that, and we know from the research in network-centred care is that often and most likely it's going to be an adult child who is coordinating that network. When you're an intimate carer, you're very busy doing that kind of business, but someone else, family, friend or adult child can coordinate that care for somebody. So we can get to see a lot of granular detail about these networks, but then we can also see where are they showing up in Australia? Are they showing up when the palliative care, so we're in a research collaboration with Eastern Palliative Care. Yep. And we're really interested in incorporating with, in partnership with Eastern Palliative Care, what happens and what's involved when a palliative care services service integrates network-centered care as part of their routine care service delivery. And then what we should be able to be, to do is to take, to look at the service catchment area of Eastern Palliative Care through postcode data, and then we should be able to see that there is um, uh, a generation um, or a generation of um, end of life care networks within their service catchment area, which is actually demonstrating impact of network centered care being delivered through a public care service. So we should be able to see a whole um, network sort of um, coming to bear within their catchment area and not as many around their catchment area to demonstrate Actually, when, when palliative care does this, they're activating, catalyzing, unlocking community networks for care. And so yeah. we can demonstrate that impact, which we've never been able to do 
And then from a more broader standpoint, we could do geospatial analysis of that data and also start to think about, well, is there a difference between rural networks, remote networks and urban networks and how does that compare to density or paucity of services? So we can start to answer a lot of questions around you know, what's happening through the social dimensions of end of life care and what are these informal care networks contributing to the end of life and how are they improving quality palliative and end of life care for Australians? Andrea, you, you, this is all based around palliative care and end of life, but I can't help but think that the ripple effects of this go, go much broader, that essentially you're creating strong communities so that when there's a bushfire, when there's a flood, when this life happens, you've already got this strong community at play that can step up in all those different circumstances. Um, you're not just supporting people, but you're building strong communities beyond those people. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously what public health, palliative care and, you know, um, is all about and health promotion approaches. So that's what we, exactly what we hope to achieve, Ian, is that we're building community capability and capacity and that it connects people and it connects people um, uh, around matters around, you know, serious illness, dying, death, loss and bereavement. Um, people are already connecting as well and they already galvanise around you know, bushfires yeah. and things like that. But so they, yeah. they do already, and this is a way of sort of formalising that connection. But I think that there's something special that we're really interested in too is when at the end of life we so often see that, and I found this through my research, we see that as a private matter and something mm -hmm. not to be shared. That's where we say we're trying to create collaborative communities for end-of-life care. We're, we're trying to sort of um, change the norms that asking for and accepting help is normal and we're, we're seeing death as a collaborative matter and that people coming together around the intimacy and the care needs of end-of-life care, um, I think there's something really special about um, doing that and absolutely where we're trying to make a contribution in our own way on building community capacity and death literacy, mm. I suppose, and like care and grief literacy in Australia through being able to send out um, targeted information, but also just bringing these networks together in a more formal way where they can link to palliative end of life care and they can link to the evidence based data that's important to support them as well. Andrea, is there a message to to government out of this, that the data that you're collecting, that the stories that are being told, the networks that are being formed, we're always talking to government about increasing access, increasing services for, for palliative care. Is there a message for government out of help that, that could perhaps lead to greater investment, better access into palliative care? Um, that would be the hope moving forward. You know, we're very grateful to the Victorian government who's been funding the unit since 1999, would you believe it? Um, so we have that state-based funding. We're, we are only in here now because of philanthropic funding. We're very grateful for the Wicking Trust who has funded us um, until the end of 2024. So without them, we wouldn't be doing this work at a national level. We know that through the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare and the recent um, activities around data collection, that there's a gap in community-based data sets and it would be helpful for the sector to know more about this. Um, so I do think that, A, we're trying to contribute to a community-based data set in Australia on palliative and end-of-life care. It's an asset and strength-based approach. So investment does make sense to leverage and support the informal assets that are around the people already. It can be done in any setting, setter, sector or environment as well. So I think that there's a lot that it can offer as a way to introduce a new model of care delivery in mm -hmm. Australia. And it would be the first, I think, in internationally at this kind of scale where we can start to systematically collect that data from broadening our thinking into public health palliative care approaches, but anchoring it into our existing kind of funding care services, yeah. but also acknowledging that whilst disability services and councils and local governments that you don't get funded to provide end of life care services, they have incredible structures, policies, settings and networks in place that make a really valuable contribution. So we're in the in the business, I suppose, we're, what we're interested from a public health care perspective is to flip those sectors that don't think they have anything to do with palliative end of life care and saying, well, actually, let's have a look at that. If public health, palliative care, everyone has a role to play and we map their sector and their services, mm -hmm. it turns out that neighbourhood houses have an incredible role to play. They're meeting with people at the end of life 
coming through their doors every day. We're just not wrapping frameworks around that, acknowledging it, and we're not de developing up targeted interventions that make sense in that environment. Mm -hmm. And disability services, disability support workers have an incredible contribution to make. They understand people, they understand their communication needs, and if not them, who? So that we mm -hmm. know that they're not funded to do this work, but they have a really valuable contribution to make as well. And network-centred care makes sense in that environment. So I suppose the whole reason that this work exists is to solve some of those really complex, difficult, broader challenges that we have. We're making, we're building these infrastructure for that to happen. We're building the digital infrastructure for that to happen. We're changing policy in different environments, in disability, in local government, in neighbourhood houses, in communities. Um, and it would be terrific to see a um, Commonwealth and state funded investment to support what philanthropy has done to get us to this point. It's yeah. not an ongoing philanthropic funded piece of work. They're not able to fund us going on. So mm -hmm. it seems to make sense that it would be useful data and a useful intervention for government, I would imagine. Parliament's just up the road, Andrea. Hopefully the <laughs> health minister and our friends up the road are hearing this message. We'll make sure they they do. Thank Andrea, you, Andrea. We appreciate it. You're at the Oceanic Palliative Care Conference to give people a, a deeper understanding of, of this. But is is the HELP app, the HELP program, something that people can just pick up now and, and, and make a start on? Yes, absolutely. We have a new, new Healthy End of Life Program website. So if you go to healthyendoflifeprogram.org, you'll find our new website. There's information about the app there. We're still doing work on that. As I said, we're new and we're coming into, into kind of, you know, bringing this right out into, into Australia. Um, so, and the app can be downloaded right now from Google Play and um, app stores. We actively seeing networks um, coming to bear now. We can look at those networks and where they are. We now know that with our partners, we're also working with Sydney North um, uh, Health Network, PHN, who are doing a massive campaign over one year to see what happens when you do network-centred care in a primary health network and we're then going to map all of the networks that are generated from that campaign and do geospatial analysis, what happens when doctors use it, councils, disability services, aged care. Um, so you can go and start using it immediately. It's covered by ethics and you can um, download the resources. There's an easy access download guide that we're designed for users. And of course, we're going to have all of those resources and more available at the booth um, and at the conference to share with people who are interested in, in collaborating with us. We're very, very keen to collaborate with everybody. And in the coming year, we'll be running a series of webinars and seminars to, to support the sector on you know, network-centered care as much as we possibly can. Such great, exciting work, Andrea. Thanks for sharing it with us today and good luck to you and Greg and your, your family. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Ian. Thanks very much. Dr Andrea Grindwood, the Director of the Public Health Palliative Care Unit at La Trobe University, the head, heart and hands leading the Healthy End of Life Program. I'll include links in the show notes to the Healthy End of Life Program and the HELP app. Thanks so much for tuning into Thursdays at three, whether that's via PCA socials or Spotify and engaging in matters of life and death. You'll find more advice, tools and support at the Palliative Care Australia website, where you can also make a donation to support our work. See you next Thursday. Ta-da.